Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm very, very happy and honored to talk uh, for um, London Vegans uh, tonight. It's great to talk uh, before an enthusiastic audience. Um, so my name is Albert Constantino and I work for uh, the National TU Section Society and Animal Defense International. So um, the NAVS is um, the historical group that mostly campaign the UK level. And when we campaign abroad, we campaign under uh, the label of animal defenders because we campaign on animal testing but also other issues, for instance animals and circuses. Um, so as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm, I'm French. <laughs> uh, I'm French in Portuguese, uh, which, which is, uh, can be quite useful to work at the European level. Uh, I've been working for the last uh, three years mostly on, on uh, the new EU directive on animal testing. And this is going to be the, the subject of my, uh, of my talk today because um, the directive has been adopted last year in September. And now uh, it's a stage where it's going to, going to be transposed in UK legislation. So that will give us opportunity to campaign and, and hopefully to improve um, legislation in, in regarding to animal testing in the UK. So uh, as William said, do not hesitate to interrupt me to, uh, and to, uh, to speak if you have something to say. Uh, that's not, not a problem at all. So first of all, I will go uh, quickly through the timeline of the of the directive so that um, everyone understands where how it came about. Um, basically, after the REACH regulation, you might have heard the, the REACH regulation. It's it's a regulation uh, regarding chemicals, which will force many uh, which for chemical companies to retest uh, their product and and trigger millions of of tests on animals. Um, after the EU passed this, this regulation, there was a need um, to, uh, to, to update uh, the current uh, legislation on animal testing because the, the last directive on animal testing was passed in 1986 and because the EU was responsible for a big increase of animal testing in the, with, uh, through the REACH regulation, um, uh, stakeholders, uh, animal rights groups, and ma many uh, MEPs uh, were asking for a new framework uh, to uh, uh, a new legislative framework to test uh, to test on animals and to, to better protect and promote uh, replacement on animal testing. But the, the work started between um, uh, from 2002, from 2002 and 2008. The Commission um, did a lot of working groups, it's a very slow process, uh, they organize uh, technical meetings, animal welfare panel, and um, also public consultation. And um, in September 2007, uh, the European Parliament adopted a written declaration, written declaration 40, which was asking uh, specifically the Commission to propose a, a ban, a gradual ban, a phase out on the use of primates in laboratories. Uh, that was an important step because um, the European Parliament doesn't have any rights to propose any, any legislation, only the Commission can uh, issue, propose legislation. So with this, with this declaration, the European Parliament was sending a strong message to the Commission that something has to be done specifically on the, on the uh, primate issue. Um, in November 2008, uh, the Commission uh, published its, its first proposal of the directive. Uh, to be fair, I think the, the Commission really tried to, um, to take the best of what of the existing <coughs> legislation in Member States and apply it uh, across, across all Member States. Uh, following the... Um, of course, there was a lot of shortcomings and, and we... Uh, we were not happy about many things. For instance, uh, on the case of primates, despite the written declaration, uh, the, the Commission did not uh, include a phase out on primate testing in, in the directive. Uh, instead, it um, it suggested some some uh, limitation that I will I will uh, focus on that later. Then, in 2009, uh, first half, it went through the European Parliament. 
uh, then through the Council of Ministers, so each of these bodies uh, can amend so the directive. The European Parliament is our, our elected representative um, in, uh, in Brussels, while the Council of Ministers um, uh, only the, the well, the ministers sit, sit in the Council, so they, it's a body of diplomats. So that's why the UK, uh, France, Germany are represented as, as member states. Um, following um, following this, this process, there was a, a series of trial meetings, trial meetings, meeting the Commission, the Council, and the Parliament, because of course there was some disagreement between the different bodies, and the trial is there to, to reach a compromise. And, and the compromise was voted in September 2010. So that's, that's where we are now, uh, from, from uh, 2011 to uh, the end of uh, 2012. All member states have to implement the legislation in, uh, in, the, um, in their country, in their respective countries. So we will, we will focus on, on the transposition uh, at the, in the UK. Uh, that's going to be um, the Home Office is going to be the body responsible for the transposition. Uh, it's always when it comes to animal testing, it's always uh, with, with the Home Office. Um, we expect uh, that the Home Office will do a public consultation in the first half of, of 2011. Uh, that's that's very important because that's going to be a rare opportunity for for everyone, uh, any member of the public, to say what they think and uh, to. To, to bring the input into that um, that transposition, because there is a risk that this, the way uh, the Home Office will transpose it will be very undemocratic. Uh, basically, the Home Office can choose how to transpose the directive. It can do it either through re regulation or through uh, primary legislation. That would be an act of Parliament. So, if uh, the Home Office decides. To, to do it with a regulation, that would be the quickest way and the, the most simple for them. But that, that will also mean that they will, um, the regulation will only go through the House of Lords and it, it cannot be amended at all. So it's, it's very, in our view, it's very undemocratic because we believe that animal testing is, uh, is an issue that concerns uh, all of us, everyone in the, in the UK. Uh, so we want, we would prefer a process of primary legislation, which would means um, that a new act would be um, proposed and it would be, it would, it would go through the House of Commons, and and through the House of Lords, where the both chambers could amend uh, the proposal of the, uh, of the of the government, and also if it goes to the. House of Commons, that means we can uh, lobby our, our MPs, we can campaign at the, at the local level, at the national level. It, it opens many more opportunities for, for campaign. Um, so that's going to be the first battle, really, is to make sure, uh, to, to try to, to, uh, to, to obtain a new, a new act for the transposition of this, um, of, of this directive. But uh, it, it looks like the, the Home Office would, would prefer regulation, of course, but we will, uh, maybe the, the, the public consultation would be an opportunity to, to influence them on that point. Uh, so when it comes to transposition, basically there are two, two methods for, the, for governments to do it, well, in the UK or elsewhere, it's either to copy out the directive or to, to interpret it, to... To, uh, the government can, also can draft its own articles or, uh, when, when it chooses to interpret or copy out means they will just take uh, the article of the directive as they are and um, implement it and, and, and copy it into the regulation or legislation. And uh, we don't want this, we want, uh, because first of all the directive um, has shortcomings, and in some parts, in some areas, the, the, the standards of the, of the directive are lower than the UK standards. So, copy out would, would mean that there would be some um, the UK standards would be undermined. And and secondly, we think that this directive uh, should be uh, an opportunity to go to go even further to really look at uh, review at the the uh, animal testing legislation in, um, in in the UK entirely, which hasn't been done in. in more than 20 years, and have something more up to date. Um, so now to go to the content of the directive, um, I will go through the key principles and also I will focus on the key art articles where I think 
uh, maybe there is a danger in the directive or maybe there is an opportunity to, to uh, obtain a lot. Um, so first of all, the key principles um, on recital 10, which I think it's a very good, uh, it's a very good recit uh, recital, it says the directive a step towards achieving the final goal of full replacement of procedures on live animals which I think is very good. I, I don't remember um, seeing any, uh, any national legislation where the final goal of the, um, uh, of the legislation is, is uh, openly to completely uh, replace animal testing. I think, I think it's a very positive point. And even if it's not an article, it's just, it's just uh, a statement of principle, the, recit the recitals have some importance because they, uh, they can be used to expand a certain provision uh, in the directive, so it can have an impact. Uh, on the three R's, I think that's also uh, an, interesting, um, an interesting point. It says that the principle of replacement, reduction and refinement should be implemented through a strict hierarchy of the requirement to use alternative methods. So what, what the directive is saying is that well, the three R's, I think it's a principle that's, that's widely accepted by many many stakeholders, whether it's universities, laboratories. But here, I think the original point is that it emphasizes that there is a hierarchy in the three R's, and the, um, the objective is replacement, and, and uh, reduction and refinement only comes when, where replacement is not, um, is not possible. It's important because many, many laboratories, and also many pharmaceutical industries, claim that they implement the three R's, but what they really do is only refinement, and they do not, they do not anything about, about replacement. So, and again, an interesting um, uh, principle in the directive. And Article 2, it says clearly that member states may maintain provisions aimed at ensuring more extensive, uh, uh, there is one missing, more extensive protection for animals, uh, there is a protection missing. So, basically, even when the directive uh, doesn't protect uh, animal as uh, like in the UK legislation. It doesn't mean that the UK um, has to lower its own animal welfare standards. It can it can keep higher standards than the directive, uh, and that's a very um, important point as well because there is um, uh, the mood is is towards uh, deregulation when it comes to animal testing. I mean the Home Office has been implementing a system of um, fast tracking for. Uh, authorization of, of animal testing, they're reducing the number of, of inspectors. So the mood at the government level is to uh, regulate less, less. But with, with this article, really the UK doesn't have any, any excuse, or any member state for that matter, to, um, to lower the standards. So now to, to focus on, on, on primates. So um, as I was saying earlier, uh, written declaration uh, number 40 voted by the Parliament was specifically asking um, the Commission to propose a phase out on, on the use of non human primates. Unfortunately, we didn't obtain that, uh, but instead, um, the Commission has, has chosen to, to restrict their use. So that's Article 8. And, and as you can see, it reads that non-human primates shall not be used in procedures as, as a principle, but with the exception of procedures undertaken with a view to the avoid, av avoidance, prevention, diagnosis, or treatment of debilitating or potentially life-threatening clinical condition in human beings. What do they mean by uh, debilitating? They mean substantial impact on a person's day-to-day -day functioning. So the issue here is, is how this is going to be interpreted by, by the Home Office. Uh, we think that it really depends how we mean by um, debilitating and life-threatening, life but we, we believe that this article should at least um, tackle the issue of uh, primate testing for, for, toxic, for a toxicological purpose, for instance, or primate testing uh, in... Um, for the military, for instance, are put them down. We think that this article should tackle this. But then again, if, if the, the Home Office decides to, to have a broader in interpretation of, of life-threatening or, um, or debilitating, then 
it means that virtually non-human primers can be used for, for anything. Uh, including uh, obesity, for instance. That was an example that was um, mentioned during the, uh, the legislative process. Is obesity uh, debilitating? For instance, should we kill primates for obesity? Well, I, th I think we shouldn't, because obesity is mostly um, a lifestyle issue. But some people on the other side of, uh, of our, our spectrum will, will argue, will want to continue to, to kill monkeys for, for obesity uh, testing. Or maybe they can test for um, uh, they can test in relation to obesity, but say that it's, it's about diabetes. That's just, so it can be complicated because obesity creates uh, diabetes. It's, it's a very it's a very tricky issue, and and we hope that the the public consultation uh, will ask um, uh, the citizen to to really to, to really um, say what they think about this, but. Um, uh, if uh, I think this this article is is broad and is blurred, but it can be an opportunity to really reduce the use of primates in uh, in the UK if it's properly implemented. So another exception is for basic research. So that's that's uh, very concerning because when it comes to applied research, we have a series of uh, of condition has to be for uh, the treatment of, of of debilitating and life threatening clinical condition, but when it comes to basic research, there is no condition at all. So as as long as it has to do with basic research, and that's very broad because by definition, basic research is um, can be anything, can be blue sky uh, research. Uh, uh, research in a university still has the right to use primates, and uh, we think that it. it it doesn't make sense and it has to be tackled because really ba basic research is, is an area where it's, it's, there is no justification at all and, and there has been some development, for instance in Switzerland there is some case law already uh, where um, a university has been uh, prevented from using uh, monkeys in basic research uh, so we think that uh, the, the UK should, should do the same and, and go further and, and, and prohibit the use of primates in, in all basic research as, as immediately and we will definitely um, emphasize on this with the Home Office. And another risk is, is that basic research is, is a broad definition, so anything that doesn't come in the uh, definition of life threatening and, and uh, life threatening clinical condition or debilitating can be uh, put under basic research, so that could be used as, as a loophole. And, and I think the Home Office is aware of this. Well, I, last time I, I met someone from the Home Office, they, they agreed, so, so hopefully that can be tackled. And um, just uh, the, the figures when it comes to primary testing in Europe, that's the figure for 2008, but the UK is now num the number one user of primates in Europe, with 3,354 in, in, uh, in 2008. It has dropped in 2009, but, but still it's a big number. And followed by France and Germany. And everywhere in Europe there has been a drop uh, overall by, by 8%. But in some countries like France there have been a 30% drop uh, in primary testing. That's, that's a lot. Um, in Austria, things have, have been uh, very big drops. I've seen Belgium to 80%, 60% drops. It's, it's, but in the UK, it's still uh, increasing. In Germany, it's stable. Uh, but I, I think that's a one, one more reason to, to really, really tackle this.